We're continuing our partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute today, and joining me is a businessman, an objectivist, and the former CEO of the Cato Institute, John Allison. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I start most of these just doing a little, little bio for the people that don't okay. know who you are. You've had quite a successful business career, but take me to the beginning. <laughs> All right. I was raised in North Carolina. My family was, I'd call them lower middle class, kind of. I was the first one in my family to ever graduate from college. I went to join a little small farm bank called BB&T in 1971 and uh, became CEO when I was 40 years old. And then we had a great run. We had... Uh, we grew from four and a half billion dollars in assets to 152 billion dollars in assets to come, become the tenth largest in, uh, financial institution headquartered in the wow. U.S., um, which is a 20 percent compound growth rate. Hmm. Um, not only that, we our shareholders did a lot better than the shareholders of other companies in the S&P 500. Our employees were happier based on turnover rates, and our customers were happy based on turnover rates. Um, after that, I, as you mentioned, I, uh, I joined the Cato Institute, and Cato's the world's leading libertarian think tank, and that was a real education and fun for me. And now I'm an executive in residence at the Graduate Business School at Wake Forest University. I'm on a number of boards, and then my wife and I are uh, hobby farmers. We're raising chestnut trees oh, is that right? and fruit trees in the mountains of North Carolina. Nice. Are you harvesting them for fruit, or are you selling the trees? Or? Uh, well, the, the, it's long story. Chestnut yeah. trees were the dominant tree in the Appalachian Mountains. They were wiped out by a blight. For almost 100 years, they've been trying to bring them back. They now finally have some trees that they think will survive. My wife's been involved in this for years, and we're hoping to raise them, and if they make it in 100 years, they'll dominate the forest again, or 200 years, whatever. Wow, well, that, that's probably a different <laughs> show altogether. Oh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> uh, but let, let's focus on, on business and objectivism. So sure. uh, it's very clear to me from, from doing a little research on you, you've really instilled the objectivist beliefs into your career. When, when did you get interested in the ideas of Ayn Rand and objectivism? I, by chance, uh, discovered capitalism, the unknown ideal, in, uh, between my junior and senior year in college. I was incredibly impressed by the first essay, and there was about the ethics of a Catholic system and the morality of a Catholic system. I studied a lot of economics, but nobody ever talked about it being an ethical system. And then from there, I read Atlas Shrugged, and basically over the next 10 years, I read basically anything I could find about uh, Iran. Yeah, so when people hear you say ethics and a capitalist system, I know a certain amount of people say, what do you mean? There are no ethics. It's everyone for themselves. Do whatever you want. Get as much as you can you know, steal, cheat, whatever you got to do to, to get there. How is that? I think that's totally wrong. And it's not my experience in business. I, and yes, are there bad business people? Of course. Are there bad doctors? Are there bad lawyers? <laughs> of course. But business in general, the way to be successful is to do a really good job for your customers at whatever it is you do, making better automobiles and providing better financial services. And it's really about creating win-win relationships with your customers, employees, and communities, and therefore rewarding your shareholders. So I, I, I've never bought that it, taking advantage of people is the way to be successful, and it's particularly not the way to be happy. Now, I know some people that made some money that I think got there taking advantage of other people, and they're the most unhappy people mm. I have ever met. And happiness is higher than money, right? Nothing yeah. wrong with money, but happiness is higher than money. Yeah. Would you say happiness is the, is the ultimate pursuit? Yeah, happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about just sort of your, your general business philosophy and how you've been able to take these companies and, and, you know, help the position so that your customers are happy and your investors are happy and, and everybody's doing well. Well, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people read Atlas Shrugged and they get involved in the politics, and the politics are interesting. I got very focused on the ethics. Uh, that, that, that are expressed in Atlas Shrugged, and I tried to incorporate that into my own belief system. And over time, was able to, as I moved up in the organization, not formally from an objectivist perspective, because there's lots of stuff people object with, but the core values and virtues of objectivism we build into our culture. And it is a very rational value system that produces superior results in the long term. I think I felt like for me and for my organization, it was a huge competitive advantage. Yeah. Did you get any pushback from any of the people at your organization? Did you say, ah, you know, I'm into objectivism, well, Ryan Rand, and, he, and even the capitalist crew might, well, might think it's too extreme or something like that? Yes. Um, now, almost everybody was okay with Atlas Shrugged. But when you leave Atlas Shrugged and get into what I think are important aspects of objectivism, people objected. But what we were able to do was sell the fundamental values and the fundamental virtues that are expressed by Rand. And I didn't call it 
ran. <laughs> I, I talked about these virtues and defended them based on their own merits. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to, you know, everybody knew I was an objectivist and I was proud of it, but I didn't expect anybody to become objective. And I don't know how many objectives there were at BBT. Yeah. But, uh, you know, after we went through the financial crisis and didn't have a single quarterly loss, which almost no bank did. Mm -hmm. Very, very few large banks. And, and our employees, I think, would all say that's because of our ethics, not because we were strategic geniuses or we had you know, some grand ideas, but we were a very ethical organization. So before the crisis, we didn't do the stuff that you have to be embarrassed for, that you did. So did you see other banks doing that? And was that very much built into, well, we're just not going to do this? Because it must have been yeah. tempting to do it, I mean, to send out, you know, sign all those mortgages mm -hmm. that you could get short-term gains on yeah. and all that stuff. We saw them and we refused to do it. And we got criticized for it at the time, by the way, mm -hmm. because some of the banks that ended up failing in the short term were doing very well. Mm -hmm. Citigroup, Wachovia, they were making a fortune because they were taking incredible risk. Um, we didn't do it, because, basically because one of our fundamental commitments is to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. That's what kind of drives, and that's how you get superior rewards, by doing a great job of your customers. And one thing I said to our employees over and over, never ever do anything that you think is bad for your client, even if you make a profit in the short run, because it'll always come back to haunt you in the long term. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we made mistakes, of course, but we didn't do any of the stupid stuff that was really taking advantage of your customers for a short-term profit. And, and uh, we got criticized. Not, not that way that we weren't making the money that people were doing sure. the crazy things. Well, but you must have had shareholders that are going, well, wait a minute, why aren't we doing all this stuff, right? Yeah, and we were, I, you know, we had put our organization together, both growing it internally and build it one block at a time. We've done a lot of mergers and acquisitions. And in all of our annual reports and all of our communication, we were really clear about what the value system would be b &T. And we told people, if you don't like this value system, don't buy our stock. If you don't think this produces superior long-term returns, don't buy our stock. So yeah, we had some institutional shareholders that put pressure on us, but not the people that understand what we were doing. And we, you know, I was very straightforward and said, I don't think this is, I'm sure this is not gonna work long-term. Yeah. This is gonna come back to haunt these organizations. So when the financial crisis hit, and then the answer is we take things that are supposedly too big to fail, and then we just made them bigger. I mean, you must've been going, what the hell's going on? I, it, killed part of my soul. I mean, <laughs> this whole idea that we had to save these large failing institutions is absolutely absurd. There was this whole, it was going to be, you know, it's going to be a domino effect, not so. Mm -hmm. uh, if Citigroup had gone broke, fine. <laughs> if yeah. Goldman Sachs, fine. Now, they would they would have been put in a bankruptcy protection. They wouldn't have all been liquidated right. and closed down. Right, the next day. They don't all... disappear. It's like yeah. automobile companies have been, met, you know, have failed multiple times. They could have, and, and the world would be a better place today, and we wouldn't have got this terrible financial regulation, Dodd-Frank, and we wouldn't got this huge attack on, on free markets. If we, if because what it appeared to be is, and what actually happened, we bailed out these large institutions, and they should have been allowed to fail. And then we let the mom and pop. We were big in the residential construction business, but we let the guy that has you know two trucks and three people working for him, subcontractor. We let all those guys go broke. Mm -hmm. So the whole response was unethical and not good for the economy. And isn't it true that the government? forced some of the banks to take the money even if they didn't want it. I think there's the famous story about the Wells Fargo guy, right, that didn't even want the bailout yeah. because yeah. they hadn't done all the risk. Dick Kovacevic, yes, and something happened with us. I actually wrote Congress and lobbied against uh, the, the financial bailout yeah. because I knew who they were going to bail out, and, and I knew that we'd have not necessarily Dodd-Frank, but bad legislation after if we did that. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we lost, obviously, and, and after the... the um, let's so what, say, is, what does that actually mean? So now you have to take this money, right? They threatened, they threatened to... What they, they call, here's what it, concrete happened. It's really, it's hard to believe. You did business properly, yep. and then you didn't want anything from the government, right. and then they forced you to take they, it. They basically threatened us and said, you know, John, you guys have a lot more capital than you've needed by traditional standards. But we have some <laughs> new standards. We can't tell you what those standards are. Right. And we're right. going to come in and audit your company, i.e. basically take it over unless you take this money. Because they wanted to force the healthy banks to participate. They, they because in, in the depression, long story in the depression, um, they tried to bail out the unhealthy banks, the market reacted. 
So they, they forced the Wells Fargo and the BB&Ts to participate. So it was obscuring that they were trying to obscure. They were bailing out yeah. unhealthy banks. So what does that do for, for the banks in, in the last 10 years or so? It's been terrible in a way because the regulatory board burden has been horrendous. There have been very, you know, there were hundreds of banks being started every year. There have been very few started since then. Mm. Uh, and the regulatory cost has become enormous. And what it's actually done, the irony, is a lot of the winners are the worst people. Mm -hmm. Or the worst companies. I'm not, I'm not trying to judge them as human beings, but the worst companies. Because they did all this regulatory stuff and made the regulators happy. And now they have what's called regulatory capture. The regulators are real nice to them, yeah. but if you're trying to start off a small bank, it's tough. It's yeah. very tough. Now it's gotten and there's also less incentive to, to less do incentive. right by your customer, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will have to say I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but but Trump ha there has been some relief to the industry regulatorily since the change in uh, administrations. Yeah. So then you, you shift over to Cato. Yes, and sir. What, what's it like working at a think tank that's trying to spread libertarian ideas? Because I do think that there is a really nice bubbling of classical liberal and libertarian ideas happening with young people. It's partly why my show is working. Yes. Um, but it's, it's a hard sell yes. to a lot of people because telling people that the government shouldn't solve all your problems is a, is a out there idea, sadly. Right. Well, it was fun. I mean, it, it, I actually went to Cato. There was a struggle going on, and, and, we, and we had to turn things around, and we did, and, and things were going great by the time I left. But uh, you're talking about really bright people who have a passion for their mission of uh, you know, creating a free and prosperous society. Uh, it is an uphill fight because we're outnumbered so you know, horrendously, <laughs> you know, yeah. and particularly in terms of libertarianism. And most people don't have any idea what libertarians are, so you have a a lot of times we were called radical conservatives. We're not, <laughs> we're not <laughs> conservatives. We have just as many beefs with conservatives as we do with liberals. Different beefs, different yeah. set of beefs. And uh, we believe in, you know, uh, economic liberty. We also believe in social liberty. You know, you, we believe that people have a moral right to enter in contracts, including gay marriage, right? Yeah. That's a contract. So we're, we're kind of outliers. But what we have seen is a pretty major movement of young people on college campuses who kind of smell that what we're doing, the Republicans and Democrats, really aren't that different and it's not working. Yeah. Um, but they're fighting an uphill battle because this politically correct movement on campuses is stifling of people that have different ideas. Yeah. Do you find that one of the hard things to do in terms of messaging, if you're trying to get libertarian or objectivist ideas out there, is that people will go, well, well what's the end point? How, how much right. government can you disassemble before, as right. I always say, we're just in Mad Max, basically? Right, right. Where, where do you draw that line? Well, I mean, I think the government has a very important but very limited role. The purpose of government is to protect individual rights. And I think that's really what the Founding Fathers thought, is to keep me from using force of fraud to take what you've earned and to keep you from doing, using force of fraud to take what I've earned. And therefore, I think the government has three basic legitimate functions. National for defense to protect us from bad guys overseas, a police force to protect us from bad guys in our neighborhood, and a very effective court system so that when we have a legitimate dispute, we can resolve it without resource to force. In our ideal world, there'd be 95% less regulations and far more effective courts than we have today. And I don't think, the thing that people need to understand is what is government? It is about force, right? You know, Walmart can beg you to buy a product, they can offer you special deals, but they can't make you. Mm -hmm. The government can make you. They can put you in jail, they can take your property, they can kill you. In fact, they've killed hundreds of millions of people throughout history. So here's my question I ask people, would you be willing to use force to make somebody do this law? I, I say you agree with the law, mm -hmm. but would you take a gun and make Dave do it? If you wouldn't, then it shouldn't be a law. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't argue about it and try to persuade him, Dave. Right. But if force is not necessary, government's not necessary. Yeah. And then just intuitively, voluntary agreements have better outcomes, right? I mean, when force is involved, you get a suboptimal conclusion almost always, right? Yeah. So it must be seriously disturbing for you as a, as a businessman when you see what seemingly is coming out of what's become the mainstream Democrats now, where you know they're kind of calling, half of them are calling themselves socialists at this point. Half of them are, you know, 70% marginal tax rate, which if you live in New York City after, <laughs> after city and state, now it's 84%. Wow. And they say that's, well, you're giving back. They're, they're taking back. But when you hear all of this, are, are you shocked that these ideas are flourishing? I or, am. or seemingly flourishing? I am. And uh, it, it scares me. 
I do think one important factor, one reason I talk about the financial crisis, is that a lot of young people, when they were young, heard that it was greed on Wall Street and deregulation that called a financial crisis. In fact, government caused a financial crisis. Errors by the Federal Reserve and monetary policy and then government housing policy. And Freddie and Fannie, that were two giant government uh, enterprises, when they failed, owed $5 trillion mm -hmm. and had $2 trillion. These are big numbers <laughs> in subprime mortgages. Yeah. So, yes, some banks made some mistakes, and they should have been allowed to fail, but they were trivial compared to the government. But the fact that people believed that the government had to save us from the greed on Wall Street, I think has pushed them towards socialism. Mm -hmm. So at least we need to get that story right. Yeah, <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. You know, because it's a wrong story. So... How would you, so you said that even though you're not a big Trump guy, that Trump has actually scaled back some of this. I mean, what are some of the things right now that you'd like to see shifted? Well, if I mean, we were to, if we were to free the economy a little bit. If it's optimal or, just, you know, I, I think there are, I don't know, I, give me, give me, give me something well, tangible I, I, and something pie in the sky. I say. think one of the easiest things you could do would be cut uh, government's uh, payroll by 25% and make the managers decide what needs to be done. You mm -hmm. do that in business, you, you know. Sometimes you have to do that. You mean you can't just keep spending more you and more, more and hiring more and more, and more <laughs> people and make sure you can never hire? <laughs> and then you hire, hire people to hire and, more people. Uh, and, and, and you have a double uh, benefit, less taxes, less spending by the government, more bit spending in the private economy, and you'd also have less interference in, in, in business. And I think you know, my experience, as bad as taxes are, in terms of economic misallocation, they're, they're a lot less impactful than regulations in terms of misallocating resources. So I, so I'd cut the government by 25% in terms of, of government policy. But, but I do think the essential issue is a lot deeper than that. I mean, I think it is a philosophical fight. Mm -hmm. And I, when I talk on college campuses, I talk about the philosophical fight for the future of America. I don't think it's about this upper level stuff. And um, it's really a clash between the classical liberal concepts of individual liberty, free markets, limited government, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the, and, the, and the progressives' ideas, which really actually trace all the way back to Plato, mm -hmm. of the idea of, of kind of a, a, you know, a philosopher king, yeah. <laughs> Obama in that yeah. case, a, a philosopher king who's going to save us all and knows what's right for us. And those are fundamentally irreconcilable positions. And they, you know, that's why you get such a, a strong reaction. Yeah. And the irony is why I think you know, we write books, you do your show, and we're trying to impact these ideas. We, what we really need to do is privatize education. If you look at innovation in the educational establishment, it's been incredibly slow relative to innovation everywhere else. And why is that? In a free market, if your business does a bad job, you get to go broke. Right. What if you run a lousy school system? You get more money. Washington, D.C. has the worst school system in America, and they have the highest per capita spending in America. Yeah. Lousy schools, more money. It's an inverse incentive. Is that just lazy thinking, though? The, the people that are always saying, well, they just need more money. They just throw more money at it. Is that is that really as simple as it comes down to? It's just lazy thinking. Like, I, oh, obviously it's a money problem, not a not a uh, functionality problem or a direction problem. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that, but I, I do think that they think money will somehow cure it, and then they have all these arguments about how it's underfunded, when in fact it's way, way, way overfunded mm -hmm. in many cases. But, but here's what I think. If you really had a private system, you'd have, you'd have innovative ideas. There's some Bill Gates out there and Sam Waltons and Steve Jobs that would have radical innovations. And one of the innovations, and I don't know exactly how, I don't know the technical part, would be about teaching people to think rationally teaching people to be critical thinkers, teaching them about personal responsibility instead of the idea of we're all victims. I mean, you know, <laughs> all of us today, we're all victims, Everybody right? Victim. <laughs> and we live in the most successful yeah. society in the history of man. You're very tall, for example. You almost whacked your head yeah, in one of our lights. Right. Victim. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 I, I, we call, and the reason I think in a private system you get those ideas, call it because they work. And over time, people, the students that went to these schools would be more successful. And you'd see nationwide change develop. There's an argument that Walmart has done more for poor people, probably has, than all the government welfare programs. So then what would you say, because we hear this all the time, well, wait a minute, the Walton family owns more money than, you know, 90% of this or that combined. And Right. <laughs> if you can get, so what's you, the argument? Bring there, me yeah. another Sam Walton, yeah. <laughs> and let, he can make all the money he wants if he improves the quality of life for all the rest. It's like Steve Jobs. Everybody on the planet practically is now able to get incredible information. It transfer, it eventually, will transform Africa when they get you know enough internet stuff up there, because they, in that one thing they have more information than 
their whole civilization had five, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Those, who cares how much money Steve Jobs makes if we're yeah. all better? Yeah. You know, I only buy an iPhone because I think, I think it's good, right? I only go to Walmart because I think I'm getting a good deal. I'm not losing. Right, and by the way, since Steve Jobs has been gone, the iPhone actually hasn't innovated as much. Exactly. And if the markets remain free, hopefully someone can come in. Somebody will drive Someone back. can come in and fix that. So, all right, so we've got a, a certain business outlook here. And it's pretty clear to me that that's pretty consistent with the rest of your views, just sort of on how to live your life. Right. Yeah, I think you you have to have one of the great benefits I've got out of uh, of studying Rand's philosophy is an integrated worldview. You know, most people have just I think piece mills and, and their thoughts and even their values aren't necessarily consistent with one another. They do one thing, they feel guilty because they didn't do something else. Mm -hmm. And and Rand presented a very integrated view of the world. It's, it's complex. It doesn't solve every problem. It doesn't answer every peripheral. But the core beliefs, the values, and the and the uh, and and the virtues are fully integrated and consistent with life on this earth. You're consistent on pursuing your personal happiness, and and I think that that um, is what's essential for organizations to be successful. And I think that means you have the same beliefs in your at home as you do at work. Mm -hmm. They're not two worlds, and I, I think that's scary. How many people act like they're two different worlds? So yeah. they treat one you know one group one way or another. That's how do you how do you live with that? Yeah. Because because but basically what you're saying is you're wrong no matter what you do. You know? <laughs> right. Either way, you're, either way you're, you're, doing you're wrong, wrong, right? So fundamentally, this all comes down, I, I think, to personal responsibility for you. Is that is that yeah, the absolutely. most easy way if we were distilling yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think Rand's three great virtues, purpose, reason, and self-esteem, mm -hmm. lead to personal responsibility. You know, as human beings, we're purpose-driven entities, and I think that's critically important. We have one means of survival, our capacity to think. And self-esteem in the pursuit of personal happiness, but also, and this is something we, in, in, in that comment about our customers, we strongly believe that really the key to success is creating win-win relationships. It's figuring out how to get better together. It's not taking advantage of other people, nor letting them take advantage of you. But there are almost infinite, not infinite, opportunities for you and I to get better together. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the world in that way, instead of what's in it for me or what's in it for you, what's in it for both of us? Yeah. <laughs> what will improve both of our statuses? How do we really help our customers and help, and help our employees? You know, how, do you, how do you do all that? How do you, and I think that's how you get optimal outcomes. And I think that underlies the whole objectivist mindset. Is how, it's about creating win-win relationships. Are, are you shocked at the amount of people that don't believe that win-win exists? I mean, they fundamentally think there has to be a winner and a loser. Absolutely, and, and you see that, the, what people's perception of business is always win-lose. It's not, it doesn't work out that way. Competition is important in business, but most of business is about cooperation, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, it's, yes, you do compete, and that's good because it's kind of self-discipline, but mostly you cooperate. Most of your energy is how to figure out how to get things accomplished together. So one of the things that I find when I do this is people are always going, all right, I, I hear someone's ideas. Well, who are the people that, that they look to for ideas? Are, are there some people out there right now business, in the business world or in the media world or anything else that, that you find are, are hitting the right tone on ideas or at least trying to get out there and, and put some yeah, things out there? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I guess my, you know, people ask me about my heroes. I, because of when I read Atlas Shrugged, I had studied very little philosophy. It, it changed my worldview, but at the same time, I said, well, maybe I'm missing something here. Mm -hmm. So I went back and studied philosophy. I know that sounds odd for a business guy, but I spent a lot of time. It's probably some value <laughs> in that. Yeah. And, uh, and I found, I, this may be not how professional in philosophy, I, I found there to be a school. Starting with Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. John Locke, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Ayn Rand and the other people in that school. And I, my heroes largely came out of that school. Now, in the, the, the world today, one of my heroes is Charles Koch. I mean, I think Charles has been terribly maligned. He created a huge company, hundreds of thousands of jobs, provided better products at lower prices, and then with all the money he could ever meet, he could have just gone off to the Caribbean, and you know, he decided that defending uh, freedom defending a, a free society was, and he's taken so much guff and, is, and he's been so distorted. That's real hero heroism. You know, mm -hmm. you know making money's good, but having the courage to defend your ideals when they don't exactly fit with, you know, what's popular, 
that's that's heroic, and so I would call Charles Koch heroic. Yeah. So none of these guys that have all this money, they're not the the evil capitalist barons that people would have them have them out to be. I'm sure there are some, <laughs> but that's atypical. Yeah. You know, I, I was fortunate. I started out as a small business lender, and I've seen multiple businesses become very successful. And every one of those people is a highly ethical person. They wouldn't, yeah. have, they wouldn't have got there if they hadn't been ethical. You, do you think that's more of the common denominator than even hard work? That it, it's a, there's a yeah, moral I think, uh, yes. groundwork? And, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a commitment to logical decision making and a commitment to actually trying to make the world a better place to live. I, very few people go into business to make money. There's a mis misconception. It doesn't mean they don't want to make money, mm -hmm. but they go into business to make a difference. To have a better restaurant, <laughs> have a better bank, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and, and that's how that most of them get their, their thrills. Now, they enjoy the reward, the, the financial reward, but that's not typically what motivates most successful business people. Are there times when you have to override the logic in business? So when you have to make a, take a risk that would not be the logical risk or you have to do something that's really against conventional thinking because... This is the opportunity, and it may not be logical per se, but... Well, I don't think you have to do, do things that are illogical or irrational. But what you do have to understand is sometimes you can't understand the risk. <laughs> and, you, you know, and you do... Um, you do I, I, I think you have to be really careful about how you manage your emotions. I think a lot of people that become emotionless, that's how they fail mm -hmm. and how they do a lot of damage. But you do develop subconscious beliefs from your experience in business. So t and sometimes you can't totally concretize those beliefs. Mm -hmm. So you're not really making a decision based on an emotion. You're making a decision on a subconscious integration of you seeing things that it's hard to explain to people that other people will see. It, to some degree, preceding the financial crisis, we were, maybe I was seeing where this thing led in, the, in a way that other people didn't see. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it was hard to explain all that, right? Yeah. Were, you, were you warning people outside of your yeah. business? Yeah, yeah. and, and I just specifically warned some people about investing in certain companies. It didn't slow them down. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are you, uh, are you hopeful for the, for the future of capitalism and, and freedom in the United States and throughout the world? Because I, it, it does seem to be in a little bit of a precarious spot right now. I am. I am. But I'm, and I don't think we can take it for granted. I don't think we can take it granted. I think it's a, you know, it's a constant fight to defend it. And I think if we ever take it for granted, we will lose. But I mean, human well-being is advancing because of free markets and less regulation and free trade. And so in that sense, I'm optimistic. But you know, if you look at human well-being from the evolution of Homo sapiens 250,000 years ago until the middle 1600s, early 1700s, Life expectancy was terrible. Yeah, <laughs> Quality was... of life was horrible. And then something happened in the 1700s, really, it was the Enlightenment, the birth of, you know, the age of reason, reason, science, f individual rights, free markets, limited government, capitalism. Those are inventions of the human mind, and they're not natural. They're not, and that's one of the problems. Tribalism, brutality is natural. That's mm -hmm. one of the things you see going, it's natural to get in a tribe, right? And it's natural to go beat the other guys up because that's how human beings survive for hundreds of thousands of years. So we have to defend those ideas. Now, they're far superior ideas, yeah. <laughs> but they have to be defended and they have to be, and, and I think because they're so much better than the alternatives. I mean, the whole idea of going back 200 years or five, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at, you really, you'd already be dead. You know, most of us would be dead. <laughs> right, right, well, right, we'd be dead by the time we're 28. Yeah, right, right, right. So, yeah. so uh, but I, I worry about it. I worry about our government crazy spending. I worry about the Donald Trumps of the world and the uh, Obamas of the world. But I'm still optimistic because freedom, liberty sells in a certain sense. And if you talk to the, even the politically correct ones, they want liberty. They may not understand they it. They may not get it. They may not get it, but they, they don't associate economics with liberty. They, you know, they're social liberals, which I am too. But they don't get that if, you, if, if Dave can't keep the money he's earned, then you've really taken his liberty away, right? Because mm. he can't do what he wanted to do and what he's earned the right to do. Freedom and liberty sells. That's the bumper sticker That's for the, this chat. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, John. And this is just one in a series of many one-on-one -on -one interviews that I'm doing right here on the Ayn Rand channel. And there's a link to a playlist right down below.